going to start this show with a question. What's the most critical factor when it comes to surviving in a hostile environment? Have a think about it while I have a look around this hut to see if I could survive here for any length of time. Well, cabins like this for anyone stuck in the bush are a godsend. For a start, there's a roof over my head. I'm at a place called Rose Inlet in southeast Alaska, and they get over 12 feet of rain here a year, so shelter is important. You can also tell that they get a lot of snow here, because there's one really big stove there, bang in the middle of the cabin. There's firewood, and even some matches beside it. There are fish hooks here, so food shouldn't be a problem, because the cove is absolutely packed with fish. There's also a freshwater creek at the head of the cove, so I won't have any problem for drinking water either. So on the face of it, I'm pretty well set up. And when Elmo Wartman and his son Randy found this hut after being shipwrecked two weeks earlier, he knew that the two of them stood a very good chance of surviving. But they left Randy's two sisters six miles away with virtually no food, water, shelter or warmth in the middle of winter. What kept them alive is the subject of this program. It doesn't matter how well the rest of your body is functioning. Essentially, if we're talking survival, it is your mind that keeps you alive. Survival is psychology, because your head is what makes the decisions about how you perceive the threat that you're faced with, and whether you're going to approach it with a realistic optimism, or whether you'll feel overwhelmed and quit and perish. This program is about the psychology of survival. Everyone we hear from has been through some sort of disaster and survived, or spent their life's work trying to figure out why they came through while others around them died. Everyone is a potential victim. Not everyone is a potential survivor. What we're trying to do is to find out why people die when they don't need to die. There are plenty of examples of individuals who have been thrust into a survival situation who have had ample food, water, shelter, but because of the magnitude of the whole have become discouraged. That discouragement has lent itself to a feeling of loss of control and helplessness, and people have perished in situations like this. One classic example is the story of the West One, a fishing boat which sank in a totally different environment to this one, in the Pacific Ocean off Hawaii. The crew took to two life rafts connected by a length of rope. The ship's captain was in one and the first mate in the other. They were at sea for two weeks before they were rescued by another ship. During that time, two separate cultures, if you like, developed in those life rafts. In one life raft under the command of the mate, the mate clearly took control of the situation. Everyone all right? Yeah. So they went through basic drills. They mopped out the life raft. They got the water out to prevent salt water sores occurring. Food and rations were all spread out equally and so on. The other life raft, none of this took place. The men did not adapt to that environment and did not help themselves. When they were rescued, the survivors in the mate's raft were able to board the rescue ship without any difficulty. But those who'd been in the captain's life raft were too weak to get onto the ship by themselves. As for the captain, he died the day before the rescue. If the ordeal had lasted for much longer, it's quite possible that lack of clear discipline on his raft could have led to the deaths of all the others on it. And remember, both groups started out with exactly the same provisions and rafts. It's a classic example. In one life raft, we're seeing a psychological disintegration occurring. And in the life raft under the command of the mate, we're seeing people take back control over the situation, control over the environment, control over the events, and certainly control over themselves. We regularly see pictures of disaster victims on TV, but pictures like this are much rarer. People fleeing seconds before a tornado strikes. 
In this critical stage, whether you panic or stay in control of your actions, dramatically affects your chances of survival. How do researchers know this? Well, they talked to hundreds of people who survived incidents like this. The 1996 crash of an Ethiopian plane that ran out of fuel during a hijacking. When I first realized we were being hijacked, the first thought I had was, well, uh-oh, this is going to be a long day. You know, the inconvenience factor of more than fear almost. The mind wants to say, no, this is not true. We're not ready for this. Uh, we'd much prefer this all to go away. And, uh, and the mind does that to you. There were a couple of guys sitting here, and I tried to sort of get their attention because they were on the outside in the window. To, I wanted to see if they could tell me where we were flying to. And these guys were totally uninterested in having any dealings. It was almost like they were reading the newspaper, you know. The problem with denial is that it prevents us from taking the basic actions that are required to survive, like double-checking where the escape exits are, uh, double-checking whether you're over land or over water. Do you need a life jacket? As reality sinks in, many people overreact, doing things that at best are inappropriate and which at worst can cost lives. The pilot came on a second time and said the plane was going to ditch. They inflated their life jackets in the back and you could hear pop, 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 pop. I stood up in my seat and told people not to inflate them. It was not the right thing to do. You, once you inflate those things, you're very immobile. It's very hard to move around. And the plane comes in and hits the water. You can feel the plane starting to tumble. And uh, that's it. I said, uh oh, I'm dead. I ain't not like this. Amazingly, 47 people escaped from this alive, thrown clear of the wreckage as the plane broke up. There was a sailboat a windsurfer and a zodiac and I said wow there's rescue there's hope but many more people had survived the impact only to die because they were trapped inside the wreckage the doctors that were there at the beach one of them told me that the first 20 bodies he examined had all drowned they hadn't died of, of evident primary injuries the implication is that many people were trapped by the life jackets that they'd inflated too soon their chances of survival reduced by what they'd done immediately before the impact. Once it had happened, the survivors were close enough to a holiday beach for rescue to be on hand immediately, so long-term survival wasn't an issue. But supposing you're miles from anywhere with no hope of rescue, that's when long-term survival comes into play, and that's when you're more likely to be thrown back onto your own resources. The body has an incredible ability to take care of itself as long as you've got some water and some food. But it becomes a psychological issue in terms of the individual's perception of whether they can make it or not. And that's where the crux is, really. So to see how that works in practice, I've come to Prince Rupert on the west coast of Canada. About 15,000 people live here, which makes this town a vital hub for lots of smaller communities dotted up and down the coastline of British Columbia and neighboring Alaska. Often the only way into those villages is by boat or plane, and sometimes they get cut off for weeks or even months at a time. So it's not surprising that the people who live hereabouts are pretty self-reliant. <laughs> 